Welcome to an all new episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. I am your host, Lisa Ann. I'd like to start this episode extending my gratitude to you for making the time to make my podcast a part of your listening experience. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review, and go back and check out some of the episodes you've missed. Today's episode, I have a little story about it. So there's things that you may or may not know about podcasting. Sometimes you do an entire episode and maybe your mic wasn't connected. Sometimes you do an episode and the person on the other end is having internet issues. And I will say my completely and totally magnificent editor, just the letter K, can make magic happen. But with this particular interview, which is such an important conversation that I wanted to have, even though Kay was able to patch it together because my guest was having internet issues and we were in and out, this was something that even Kay suggested. This is an important conversation to have. So you should redo this episode. And my guest was nice enough and really wanted to redo it because when you're dealing with being bumped on and off the internet, what ends up happening is you're so stressed, you never get into a really good flow of conversation. So I'll get to more of what that's about when I get ready to do that little intro there. But before I do that, I've got some exciting news. On the day that you are listening to this, if you are a first day listener, which releases every Wednesday, you are now privy to the information that I am back on the air talking sports. And the network is Better Sports Network. You can find out everything about Better Sports Network at bettersports.com. And that is spelled B E T T O R. Little spelling thing there. So B E T T O R. It is an app based platform with a ton of different options for interactions with not only guests, but listeners and chats. And it's really, really cool. It, it reminds me, it mimics a bit of Cameo when I do like live events on Cameo and there's group events, but I am going to be live every Wednesday with Rick Kamla from 7 to 10 PM Eastern time on the Better Sports app. You will also be able to catch the shows on demand. So though it's a free app, if you subscribe, it unlocks, I think it's like $2.99 a month. It unlocks all of the interviews in separate files and separate uh, playlists and then all of the episodes. So if you can't listen live, you can go back and listen on demand. But what's cool about this, not just the fact that I get to be back exercising my, my voice and my love for sports and my passion for all things fantasy football, sports betting, basketball, fantasy basketball, but... There's a great story behind this. So Better Sports Network was an idea from my boss that used to work with me at Sirius XM, Matt. And Matt had come to me when he was getting ready to leave Sirius, which was a little bit after I left Sirius. And he said, I have this idea and I want to do this different style platform and, and da, da, da. And so we talked about it. And then as it came to fruition and he started to build the shows, we, we reconnected again. And... The big picture is no matter what, I want to work with Matt again. In 2013, Matt gave me my first opportunity to talk sports on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio. And that was such a turning point in my life. That was me getting rid of the fear that I lived in of like, oh my gosh, is anybody ever going to hire me again because of what I've done for a living? Am I ever going to have a secondary career? What am I going to do with the rest of my life? Then you tie in the fact that sports is like my ultimate hobby. Watching games is when I'm the most relaxed. I mean, man, there was a catch last week for the Eagles, Devonta Smith, that like I'm on my couch and I got chills from head to toe and had that reminder of why I love sports so much, just how dynamic athletes are and how precise a quarterback can be and how you never thought he could make that catch and how did he make that catch and I love it. And it brings me just this level of excitement. So when you add the two things together that I was feeling this little bit of calm that there might be a future for me outside of the adult industry, and then this, oh my gosh, am I going to get to do something that is so natural for me that I absolutely love? Am I going to be able to tell my friends, I'm sorry, I can't hang out because I'm actually on my couch, relaxed, watching sports for a living. Like this is really going to be my future life. And I remember when I got that first contract with SiriusXM, it was a one-year contract. And one of my best friends said to me, 
Well, you have to make sure that you do such a good job that they can't fire you. Everyone was afraid that I was going to be a flash in a pan. You know, you're just using my name to maybe build more excitement towards the channel or get more social media followers or whatever it could be. And I knew that I had that year to really plant my feet, to listen to sports radio eight hours a day, to learn from all of the best hosts, to read all of the material that was shared with me, to go to all of these different sites. I had Bob Harris on from the Football Diehards a couple of episodes ago, and he was a big advocate for me that first year in 2013 and gave me access to the Football Diehards website so that I could just be in there and getting up-to-date injury reports and getting all of this information. And I took that year as if I am working this year to get another contract. And so as I went on for the seven years of being with Sirius XM, I built this bond with Matt. And, you know, Matt has been a friend to me, a boss to me, and more kind to me in a sense than even my own parents. And I was going to leave something in Matt's office one night after a show. And my show was 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. Eastern time. That was Lisa Ann Does Fantasy. And so when I would see Matt during the day, if I would go into the SiriusXM studios during the day and I would see him, his door would be open. But this was my first time going there at night and I had to slide something under his door and his door was closed. And Matt had printed out my retirement letter from my first book, The Life, that talked about me and my new opportunity with SiriusXM Fantasy Sports Radio. And if you've read my second book, The Life Back, you'll understand my mother had not one photo of me in her entire house. Like my parents didn't put things of mine on the refrigerator. Uh, I didn't live that life. So the bond that I have with Matt, and that was such a moving experience. I remember it brought me to tears. I was like, oh, Matt has my retirement letter on the door to his office. He's so proud of me. And when you're, when you really like somebody you work for, you work harder because you want to make their job easier. You want to make them be that person that was right. I was right to hire Lisa. I did the right thing taking a chance. I'm sure there were a lot of doubters when Matt first brought me on to Sirius XM. And so when this came about and the Better Sports Network was becoming a thing and Matt reached out and I said to my agent, like, well, here's the thing, no matter what, I want to work for Matt again. And so we got to make this work and we'll find a way to make this work. And, and then I started to see the announcements of other people with these shows on Better Sports Network. And I realized this is the crew. Like there's so many people that I knew from Sirius who they're still maybe on Fantasy Sports Radio, but it's a part-time thing and they could do a couple shows for Matt. There's not a conflict of interest there. But what was cool was it reminded me of how so many other people from Fantasy Sports Radio felt about Matt. He's just a great boss. He's a great leader. He's got that energy, just the positive vibes only thing is like what he is truly about. Always just a great communicator. You know, he offered me classes through Sirius XM, which I took. He always wanted to make me better. And now here I sit and we're talking about co-hosts. So Adam Ronis was my co-host on Lisa Ann Does Fantasy for years. And then I was introduced to Rick Kamla. And at the time, Rick Kamla, who is still on NBA radio every day, a show called Give and Go. At the time, though, Rick Kamla had just moved from the NBA uh, main place in Atlanta and was working in Houston at Sports Radio 610. So see how this all ties together. For those of you who know me, you know how this ties together. So at 2015, after doing two years of shows for Fantasy Sports Radio, I had purchased the device that SiriusXM used to broadcast remotely, and I decided to learn everything I need to know about this device. Oh, I realized, oh, I don't, I, I don't have to just use this to work for SiriusXM. I can get local station's IP address, and I can enter it in just like on Radio Row at the Super Bowl or any events where broadcasters are patching in from a live event into a main studio, well, that's what they patch in with. And so as soon as I learned this in 2015, I started reaching out to radio stations that I knew. Can I come on on Fridays for Fantasy Football Fridays and do a free spot? Just kind of taking lineup questions from your listeners, what have you. And 
It was Matt McGann, the master of signs, college game day. You can just Google those things and you'll see it all. Matt was working as an intern in 2014 at Sports Radio 16 in Houston. And when the 2015 season was started, Matt reached out to me and said, hey, I'm interning for the station. I think it'd be great for your Fantasy Football Fridays. And the relationship was built to the point where I went back for a wedding right before the pandemic in 2020 uh, for Sean and Amy, Sean Pendergast, who's on the show that I do on, on, on Friday mornings. And so to tie Rick in, it was a fantasy football event. Rick Kamla had just started working at Sports Radio 610, and we were going to be on stage together hosting this fantasy football event for listeners. And so I get to meet Rick and Rick and I were also crossing paths with fantasy sports radio, as well as crossing, crossing paths through Sirius XM on Mad Dog. So Rick and I connected right away. I met his wife. I love her. Now Rick is now in Florida, which is why we didn't start the show this week because of the storm. But Rick and I got to know each other through Sports Radio 610 in person. Like before I had met people that I worked for, worked with that lived other places with Sirius XM, I had like instantly met Rick and connected. So when we were going through host, Adam Ronis already has a bunch of shows and Rick Kemla was brought to be. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so perfect because Rick and I have this bond. Since then, I have... Um, met up with him and his wife uh, other times. And, 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 you know, when I, if I'm in town, we would make sure we'd all do lunch or something. And he's just a great human. They recently had a little baby girl, um, and a great person. So like, it's funny how this big world is actually such a small place. Once you get into your niche, which mine is sports radio at fantasy sports. Now, Rick is well-versed in every sport, including college football. So I'll be probably throwing to Rick, when it comes to college football questions, because you know, I don't really follow that much college football, but when it comes to like draft research, following college football really helps. So I know what I'll do is I'll set up, who do you see from these schools? Like I'm already mapping out how we'll be talking about things that I don't follow, but Matt, but man, Rick is football, basketball. He talks basketball two to four hours a day, every day, baseball, like sports, 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 sports. So I am stoked. The show launches Wednesdays. It'll be on live from 7 to 10 p.m. My co-host, Rick Kamla, and I get to reconnect again. We haven't worked together since my last week at Sirius. My last week at Sirius, he and I, we would do the replacement spots for Mad Dog Sports Radio's morning show, The Morning Men. When they would go on vacation, because I became such a big part of Foul Nation and their fans, their listeners are called Fouls. And when they would go on, on vacation, it was just easy for me to come in and fill the role. And it was great exercise for me to be able to host and run a morning show for three hours and for Rick to be my co-host. And when, when we were looking at the days, Rick is doing this show solo five days a week right now. Now I was only going to do one day. Uh, that's what I agreed. I was like for now, for this year, one day next year, I'll probably do five days. But we were talking about days and I said to everyone, I'm like, why don't we do Wednesday? Because I'm sure it'd be a great break halfway through the week when you host a show alone, it's a ton of work. So at least Rick knowing that he's got me every Wednesday kind of gives him a little bit of a, a icebreaker there midweek because he's doing so much radio. So you can download the Better Sports app. You can find out everything about them at bettersports.com, but it is amazing how 2013 to 2022, the things that have happened, the people that I've met, the experience that I've had and how it all comes together. And it comes together because you never leave a job in a negative way. When I left Sirius XM, I left as friends with everyone. I left still being a guest and calling in sometimes on the morning men, still being a big part of fantasy sports radio and listening to those shows and tweeting with them, still staying engaged. And I think it's an important lesson for everyone of like, don't burn bridges. There is no need to burn bridges because you know what? Had I burned a bridge when I left, I wouldn't be telling you this story right now. I wouldn't be on this app doing a show. I wouldn't have this new opportunity. I wouldn't be reconnecting with my boss. And it's something I learned many years ago. It's something I learned in the early 90s about the way we treat people and the way relationships end. I still have a cordial relationship with my ex-husband. We still text on birthdays and holidays and on our wedding anniversary. I still spent time with him, though it didn't work out. 
It doesn't mean that that seven years of my life needs to be erased. So when something is ending, it's really important to take a step back from whatever emotions you're feeling, whether it's negative, whether the work environment was toxic, whatever you might've thought was happening at that moment, that is you at the boiling point. If you step back and looked at why you stayed in that situation for so long, there was a lot of good there. And that good that is there is what you need to celebrate. We're pretty lucky as humans that we can kind of forget bad stuff pretty easily and remember good stuff. And so always remembering that good stuff really pays off. And again, it's shining through right now. It's shining through because I'm remembering what brought me to decide to leave Sirius XM. The thoughtful approach I took, I thought about it for three months on my own and talked to my friends about it before I did it. I thought about how I could do it to make it easiest for everyone. And I remember I went to the morning men and I said to the guys like, hey, when are you taking your next week-long vacation? Because I know your listeners really like it when Rick and I are your replacements. And I don't want to leave you high and dry. I know you have so many vacation days left of the year. Let's map this out because I'm planning on leaving Sirius XM. And I'd love to do a week on your show every morning before I do that without you guys having to adjust last minute. Like I made sure... Everything was handled kindly and professionally. And you look back on these things and there's a sense of pride of just being thoughtful, being deliberate, making choices rationally, not rushing and not being negative because there's no reason. To live in gratitude is every experience you have. If you're leaving a situation You should be grateful because you obviously know something better is out there for you. That's why you're leaving. And so here I am, excited to be on air, excited to be back with Rick Hamla, excited to be back working for my boss who gave me so much confidence in my future, not just in talking sports on the radio, but in my future. He believed in me. And because of him, so many other people were on board and believed in me too. And now I get to celebrate that all over again. And I'm super duper, duper stoked. Remember when I first met Matt, I went looking for apartments in the city. This is when I was still living full-time in LA. And I was like, I just want to get a little studio so that I could always be in New York to do my shows. And at that time I would be on the road feature dancing like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning, I'd fly to New York. I'd watch the games. I'd do my show from the studio Monday night. Uh, I'd be done at midnight. Usually I have a slice of pizza, stay up, go to the airport at 5 a.m., fly back to L.A., and then I'd work in L.A. Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday before I flew out. My life was crazy. But when I was looking at apartments, the very first apartment I looked at, the one in Times Square, uh, it faced the Sirius XM building. And I opened the, the blinds and I said to the realtor I was with, I was like, oh, well, that's work. And I want to work there for a long time. And I want to look at that building. I want to manifest my future there. And he made me still look at other locations. He's like, I can't. As a realtor, I just can't let you fall in love with the first place you see. But I knew being able to just walk across the street and go to work was going to be ideal. I knew when when I wanted to have a meeting with my boss or I wanted to stop by and have a coffee or whatever it was, I knew I could be accessible. I knew it was, and it was, it was the perfect thing that I could do was to face that building. And so Here I am, incredibly grateful, super thrilled to be back on air, super thrilled this is such an easy platform for everybody to use uh, and such a great app, and I think you're all going to really love it. So that's big news right here. And the other big news is my guest. My guest ties into the then kind of flipping around and going back to LA full-time and realizing, whoa, I was much happier in a studio apartment. Then I discover minimalism. Then I take two years to cut my life down by 75%. Then I move into an apartment full-time, which I'm in right now, that could fit in the bedroom of my other house in Los Angeles. And it has felt so freeing because what it has done for me financially, the new habits that I created, the fact that I no longer am run by stuff. Being a minimalist is a way of living that is so freeing. And it didn't hit me until the first six months to a year where money was staying in my bank because I wasn't buying as much stuff and it was adding up and it made me really think about, do I need that? Do I want that? What's the difference? Let me leave it here and see if I still think about it. 
So financial freedom is what minimalism provided me. And so financial freedom is what I am getting ready to talk to you about with my guest, my guest today. But before I bring on my guest, a word from my sponsor. Guys, confidence can take you far in life and it can also help you in the bedroom, especially when it comes to like stepping up to the plate. You know what I mean? That's where Blue Chew comes in. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis in a chewable tablet at a fraction of the cost. You can take them any time, day or night, so you can plan ahead and be prepared to step up to that plate. The process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com. You can use my code LISA, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online, so no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew is made in the USA and is prepared and shipped directly to you in discreet packaging. Sign up at bluechew.com today. Use my code LISA. This is a chance for everybody to learn some new things and make sure you go to personalfinanceclub.com. Follow all of the social media addresses. You're going to learn a lot and I know this is going to bring value for all of us. Today's conversation is going to be something everybody wants to and needs to hear. I am sitting with Jeremy Schneider of personalfinanceclub.com to talk to you and to talk to me about kind of some debunking, some myths on savings and how to get to your financial personal freedom. Jeremy, thanks for joining me today. How are you? Great. Hi, Lisanne. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. I am excited because since we last spoke and I found you in a news article I was reading, you know, I really realized there's some 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 myths here that I think people truly don't understand or are fearful about how to get started. And I want to start with the most basic conversation of financial awareness. What we see is people feel they don't make enough money to save. But what I see from your social media is some very basic Comparisons. If you drive the used car that you own versus the new car that you want, how much quicker you can save money and how many years for that adds up to something major. So for you, how did you, Jeremy, get started in this path to financial domination? <laughs> um, you know, I grew up in a very frugal family. And so, you know, my parents did not have much money when their children, they kind of instilled that in me, but, you know, they did better. And then um, my story is I, I got a degree in computer science. I turned down a job offer from Microsoft coming out of college and instead started the company. And then I sold that company when I was 34 for just over $5 million. I retired at 36 and then I basically followed my passion, which is helping people with personal finance and investing. Um, and you know, so now I'm 41, I, my net worth is about four and a half million dollars. My share of that sale, by the way, is about $2 million. So my net worth has more than doubled since then not gone down. Um, and yeah, I love this. And so people sometimes say, but Jeremy, you're not just like, you know, cutting out lattes to make your money. And like, that's true. And the cutting out lattes thing is kind of silly, but baked into my story before, during and after the sale of my company, I was living very frugally, spending less than I made, investing along the way, which has allowed me to be financially independent forever instead of like burning this money down to zero. And also when you sold your company, though your share two point whatever million, I think a lot of people at that age, it would have been very easy to go out and buy things and do more things that they, you know, because that's a big chunk of money to come into in your early thirties. Yeah. So what did you do when you initially came into that money to keep you still in the same mindset that I'm not rich right now, but if I do this right, I can be financially free. Yeah. Well, you hear those stories about you know, the guy who like wins a lotto. He's like a garbage man, wins a lotto. And then three years later, he's a garbage man again. And I was like, Hmm, I don't want that to be me. And and when, you know, when I actually sold my company, there's this weird period of time where we, we shook hands on the purchase price. And then there's like three or four months before the money showed up in my account, like due diligence and legal and escrow, whatever. all of these things. Yes, exactly. And so for like three months or four months, I, you know, at, and at, at that time in my life, I was living on $36,000 a year. I was the lowest paid employee in my company. I was driving a 99 Ford Explorer, had roommates, like I was living extremely frugally. And so it was just like this really bizarre three months where I could run all these thought experiments. I'm like, I could go buy a Lamborghini. Like, what's that cost? Like $200,000 or $300,000? I could easily do that, pay in cash and still have $1.7 million left. But, you know, then I just sat with that for like a week and I was like, where would I park it? 
I would look like a douchebag, you know, <laughs> um, you know, and, and I was like, I could go in the store and just like run down the aisle and push everything, like put, stick my arm out and push everything into my cart. And then I'm like, well, what would I do with all that stuff? You know? And so <laughs> it was honestly like a really helpful time because all those thought experiments, like helped me understand like what really brings joy in life. And I think the answer for me is basically freedom with like my time and decision-making and stuff doesn't buy that stuff is the opposite of that. You basically have to work harder to like, you know, Ferraris require garages maintenance. and maintenance yeah, yeah. and, you know, like detail and whatever, you know? Um, and so I was like, you know, I'm just going to keep living frugally. And, um, and it also takes some time to kind of like wrap your head around that amount of money. It's like, is this a lot of money? Is this, I'm going to spend this quick. And, you know, it turns out it is a lot of money, but you're right. You know, if you start flying private and, and buying Lamborghinis, you can burn that in a, a year or two. Easily. I mean, look, I think it's one out of every five lottery winners files bankruptcy within the first five years. Yeah. Um, and also we see athletes come into way more money than what you came into selling right. your company. And one of the greatest series ESPN ever did in the 30 for 30 special called Broke. And it interviewed all of these athletes and they told the stories and it just made perfect sense once right. you actually look at it. And also it was a payment process where they'd buy a home here, they'd buy a home here, they'd have this. Next thing you know, their payments, you know, they only get paid when they play games. Right. So in the off season, they're not getting paid. And by the time camp would come, some of them couldn't wait to go back to camp to have all the food because they had spent all of their money and they were yeah. tapped out. So you had the right upbringing, being raised frugal and understanding, but that three months was really valuable that allowed you those mind games you played with yourself. People believe like, Oh, stuff is going to make me happier, yeah. but stuff you still have to take care of. You right. still have to have space for that stuff. And I, at the end of the day, that stuff holds you down from being able to move freely in the world. And I'd rather have experiences. So this was your time to say, if I do this right, I could be set for the rest of my life. Whereas most people could easily blow through that by the time they're 40. Right. And for, uh, for you, you had a chunk that you came into. Now, when you first go back to not taking the job from Microsoft, did your parents and people in your life think you were crazy for wanting to start your own business? That was kind of a what if, like could win, could lose, right? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know. I think I've always just been kind of a forge my own path kind of kid. I guess I'm not a kid anymore, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think by that point, my parents were already <clears throat> used to me not following the path. I, I was, I was an athlete in college. I ran track and like no one in my family had ever been in sports before. And so, um, and I went to the university of Michigan, big 10 school, I broke records. Like, um, you know, they were like, what, what is this kid doing? And so when I decided to start a company, they're just like, whatever, you know, um, there wasn't any pressure. That's I think some children get from parents about like, you're, you're doing it wrong. Um, so yeah. And you're right. There was a, it was a black hole. I remember, I remember being scared. Like my motivation, those first, several years was one of hunger and not like the metaphorical ambition, like the very literal, I need to put food in my stomach because if I don't go and sell a product, no one will give me money and I can't use that money at the grocery store. And so, and you know, there's no, for sure, no guarantees. And like I said, up until the moment I sold the company, I was living like really, really cheap just to like help grow the company. And so, you know, there's a lot of unknowns for years there. And that experience of living cheap and having roommates and having a more frugal lifestyle, you probably realized you weren't unhappy as a human being. Totally. Right? Like I, I often ask people this, like think about the happiest moments in your life going back. It's like really the time, like it's the time I bought that new shirt or it's like I upgraded to first class and that just brought me this long-term last of joy. You know? <laughs> and, you know, I, I still don't fly first class. Like, like maybe I should start, I don't know, but you know, buying stuff like that, it's like, gets a very short term endorphin and you, you know, for a moment you'll feel that actually I'm talking to you on my brand new computer right now. And I, I feel very good about buying it, but you know, I'm not going to look back in 10 years and be like, man, when I bought that computer 10 years ago, that my whole really, life changed. Everything started to work out for me. Yeah, I know. It's, it's true. True happiness. I discovered. Listen, I'm the same with first class. I mean, when you look at the difference in the price, I just can't do it. Now, when companies yeah. fly me, they'll often fly me first class. What I've done is I've stayed loyal to one airline, which is American Airlines. So, you know, I'm often getting bumped up, which is like this surprise free gift that you yeah. get. But 
when you're looking at a ticket that's 400 versus 1700 to go to the same place, I just can't justify yeah, it. So yeah. to me, it's not that big of a difference. I don't mind traveling. I'm much shorter than you, so it's probably even easier for me. But let's talk about things for the beginning. People who are wanting to start with these simple things like savings, what are some suggestions you give to all ages about how they can look at what they're spending and maybe minimize some things to start? Because I think once you start saving, it's easy once it starts to build. But that first step, how do you get somebody to take it? Well, as when we start talking about logistics, I always like to remind people of my two rules of building wealth. Rule number one is to live below your means. That means spend less money than you make. So if you make half a million dollars a year, which some people do, athletes, whatever, and you spend half a million dollars a year, you're broke. You're not rich. You have zero. 500 minus 500 is zero. Um, And rule number two is to invest. Maybe we'll talk about it later. But, you know, so no matter what you make, you have to spend less than you make. And some people make $60,000 and they say, there's no possible way I could spend any less. And, you know, my answer is like, what do you think people do who make $40,000? You know, they spend $20,000 less. And so when you're looking at your own life, you know, I think the first two things to look at are housing and transportation. Like those are the big ones. And I think people overspend in these areas. And, you know, you you might kind of refer to the car earlier. The average new car payment in the U.S. right now is like around $600 a month. If you invested $600 a month over the course of, you know, a 40 year working career, it's like millions, like three or four million dollars. And, you know, when I was building my company, I was like the CEO of this like little tech company. I was driving a 99 Ford Explorer. I bought it for $3,000 in cash. I drove it for six years. Every year or so it needed a repair. And that was like 500 bucks. And that's like the number one, you know, argument I say when people, when I like suggest don't buy a new car if you're not like already wealthy. And they say, oh, I need to be reliable. Like, of course you want a car to be reliable, but you know, cars, you know, rarely just stop in the middle of the freeway and get you know, slammed. Like what really happens is like, starts to make a noise. You see a light come sure. on. You just have to go uh, run an errand and then you pay him 500 bucks, which is a lot. I don't prefer to pay 500 bucks, but it beats $600 every single month, which is $7,200 a year. So $7,200 versus 500, like right there could make you a millionaire over the course of your career. So yeah, I'd say look hard at those two things, housing and transportation. Are you renting too much apartment? Do you live in too big of a house? Do you drive too new of a car? If you can bring those down, you could dramatically open up your budget and save a lot of money. And also add on to the car. When you're not driving a brand new car, your insurance could be up to $100 less a month, which is another $1,200 a year. Because when you're driving a used car that you own, you're not paying all the different things, even whether you lease the car or buy the over expensive car, your insurance is double than somebody that owns their car outright. Yeah. And same is true for housing too. Homeowners insurance, mortgage interest, realtor fees, uh, you know, rent, cleaning, like all this stuff, you know, as your lifestyle increases, it's kind of like this uh, amplification effect of all those associated things that also get more expensive. And so, you know, living simply realizing that stuff doesn't bring you like when, you know, I currently live in a very nice house. I paid $700,000 for it. And now it's worth like 1.1 million. When I think about the happiest time of my life, I'm like, that extra bedroom just brought me so much joy. I think about like the time in my 20s where I lived in like a 400 square foot hole in the wall. And, you know, um, and so you just have to like, but our society is like built up such that it's like, um, you know, stuff society and and there's all this marketing and, and consumerism. And we're just constantly being like trained to think the next purchase will make us more happy. And so I think if you really take a look internal and see what truly makes you happy, you kind of have to just eschew that stuff. It's not easy. You know, you want to like get that little endorphin boost and like drive up in your new car to meet your friends or whatever, but they don't care. Like you care. Like I couldn't even tell you what car my friends drive or care less. I actually would like them more if they drove crappy cars. I think it's like a little more authentic. So yeah, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to like make that mindset shift. But I think when you do, then you can see where, you know, you can bring your budget down. Well, in America, we see anywhere from three to 5,000 commercials a day. And whether that's watching YouTube without, if you don't pay for the premium and you get commercial, whether it's television, whether it's listening to radio ads, we are constantly being fed. We are a consumer society. And it's one of the things I love the most about Europe is how simple everyone lives, even to the stores. Like they laugh that we have Sam's and Costco because they can just go to the market like every day and pick up the couple things they're going to make for dinner. They buy fresh. They don't believe in like storing stuff. They don't understand why anybody would buy that much at one time. And it makes them not use and not waste. Yeah. Yeah. I, 
and it's hard to get out of that mindset when you live it every single day. But uh, once you realize that, like, you know, you don't, you know, this isn't the way that we kind of are trained to do it isn't the way you have to do it. And I think when you, it's a freeing experience. I think another argument I hear is people say, hey, I don't want to live cheap. I want to live now. Not, I don't, I don't care if I'm rich when I'm 70, but this is about being happier now, right? When you, when you're like budget is like, when you're spending every dollar you make, you are stressed about losing your job. That's like devastating. You're stressed about yeah. working every day for the rest of your life. You're stressed about the economy shifting. You're stressed about taxes, like, you know, stressed about your kids needing money. You're like there's, when you're pushing yourself, your budget to limit like that, everything becomes more stressful. If you can live below your means, open up some of your income, invest, build some wealth, make up a buffer, you are happier today. And that like stuff that you like forgot you bought a month ago, it, it doesn't even come into your mind anymore. And so, you know, I don't know, it's almost like an addict, right? It's, you know, when, you, when you're like talking to a, a, a physical substance addict or something and say, hey, you know, on the other side of this addiction, it's better. Um, I think they might know that and they might want that, but it's hard not to always be wanting the next hit. And so you kind of have to get over that, that next hit of like, you know, the endorphin boost from buying stuff. Uh, well, in 2016, I discovered minimalism uh, by watching a couple of documentaries, reading a ton of books. I took two years and I got rid of 75% of my belongings. I also moved into a space that was 75% smaller, no longer have a car. And I will, I will say like, it was the most freeing. There was a lot of guilt associated with understanding. Like it was about really mindfully going through everything that I owned, asking myself, why did you purchase this? I had the time. I was able to sell a lot of things. I was able to give things away, but now I spend completely differently. Now going and shopping is no longer a hobby. I might go and look around, but I don't have to buy something. Whereas before, if I went out to look around, I was coming home with bags of clothes. And now if I buy clothes, I have to get rid of the same amount of clothes because I don't want to store. So I fill the bag, but it really makes you think. And all of a sudden your bank account starts to add up because you didn't realize how yeah. much you were spending a day here, a day there. You didn't think about it. So when it comes to not living beyond your means and starting to save, what do you suggest in today's climate for somebody to have as their emergency money? I know years ago it was three to six months. And I know for a lot of people, they can't even really look at what three to six months looks like saying, I just can't touch that money. That's just in case I lose my job or something happens. Yeah. I mean, I'd say the first step, you know, the, I kind of have this order of things. The very first thing you do is you max out your 401k match if you have one. The second step I'd say is to attack your debt. So if you are in debt, credit card debt, and, and what I would say is non-mortgage debt. So credit card debt, auto debt, medical debt, personal debt, anything like that, because that debt for a lot of people is the entire problem with their budget, right? If you're paying $1,000 a month in interest, that's crushing. You know, $1,000, oh. if you can get rid of that debt and invest the $1,000 a month that's just currently getting burned to the banks, you know, you would be a multi, multi-millionaire over the course of your career. and. And I think that, you know, kind of like you mentioned with the football players where they get into this like monthly spending, this payment mentality was like, these are my payments. I make the payments. This is the way I live. And I, I have this thing, one of the, it's like looking at payments, looking at monthly spending is, is a broke habit. A rich habit is looking at total amounts. So when these NFL players, you know, and all due respect to NFL players and like, I yeah, talked to I, a lot of them yeah. and, and they're basically a set to fail, right? They're like, they train their whole lives to play this sport. They've never they seen They get handed a ton of money way too young with no education on what to do with that money. Exactly. And then they expect this, this like fire hose of money to continue. And then when it stops, they've been spending like with a certain like expectation. And of course they're set for, to fail. So, but you know, they look at a monthly payment, like, okay, I can buy this multi-million dollar house, make, make, if they afford the payment, well, they should be thinking about it. It's like, okay, if I have $2 million, don't buy a $3 million house. That's negative 1 million, you know, buy a $500,000 house and, you know, then take that 1.5 and start to grow it. Um, what was the question? I just get... How many months savings do you think <laughs> okay, is realistic, yeah. you know, for so, emergency yeah. fund? Yeah. So I, yeah. Do, I do think three to six is reasonable. You know, if the reason it's three to six months is because a year is like a very long time to not have a job and right. stuff can change in a year. You know, it's not like, if a year goes by and you're just like sitting in your hands, like not working a side hustle, not, you know, picking up a bartending shift, not growing your career, like something very unusual is happening or, you know, and, you know, three months is pretty short, you know, it's so like, you know, you, 
things can happen in three months where you're like, yeah. you're caring for a family member or whatever. Plus over six months, that amount of cash, if you have more cash, you can put that to work. You can be investing that. So you want like a medium amount to be ready to spend in cash and then anything over that, put that money to work, get that invested. And then if you need to, you can go back to your investments and take it out. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd go after my debt first and then go after the three to six months of uh, emergency fund. And something you mentioned recently on social media is that you don't believe in debt consolidation. Can you explain this? You know, everyone wants, like, you know, we live in this like society where everyone wants like the diet pill, the quick fix. And so someone who has, you know, 20000 or $30,000 of debt across credit cards, student loans, whatever, like, oh, like, let me pull some fancy financial footwork and, you know, re re rearrange this or reconsolidate it or get a better rate or whatever. But at the end of the day, this is how you get out of $30,000 of debt. You give them $30,000. Like, that's it. That's the solution. Everything else is what I call pushing peas around the plate. It's like a kid that's not eating his vegetables and just like keeps like moving around. Like you can you can shuffle those peas around any way you want, but you know how you give it up, you got to eat it. And 30, it's like intimidating to pay $30,000 of debt. But if you get serious and say, okay, how many months is it going to take? If I can do a sure. thousand, yeah, if I can do a thousand dollars a month, that's thirty months. That's yep. like you know Boom. two and a half years, and yep. uh, it's not you know paying a thousand bucks a month for two. And there's interest, so it's not going to be exactly two and a half years. It might be two years and seven or eight months. But when you go aggressive at that debt, the interest rate doesn't really matter. And so if you're reconsolidating or getting a better rate or whatever, you're just kind of setting yourself setting up yourself up for an expectation of being in debt for your entire life, which is an expectation to fail. And so I'm not saying never do this, it's bad, but it might, you know, be realistic. It might save you a few hundred bucks in interest. And if you, instead of this mental energy you're putting into reconsolidation, you put into like, you know, working a budget, having a garage sale, just, getting yeah, an yeah. Extra, picking up an extra shift, you could just be paying down that principal and the interest would go down because you owe less money. And also the debt consolidation companies are not fee free. They're making money too. So sometimes by reorganizing this, it might make somebody feel better because they look at it like I only have one bill coming in. Right. But if you did the math at the end of it, it's going to be the same amount of money. Do you suggest, let's say somebody has three credit cards. Uh, what do you, suggest, do you suggest the program to be? Pay off the highest one first or for the feeling of building confidence, try and knock one out that's the lowest first or would you pay evenly across the board to make sure that they're all getting paid off at a due time? So when you have multiple debts, I think most people who are in debt aren't in debt for like failure to be able to do the math. I think they're in debt for reasons of habits and emotions and um, behaviors and all that stuff. And so the, my favorite way to do it is called the snowball method, where you line up all your debts, you sort them from smallest to largest, you pay the minimum on everything, the lowest you can pay and still stay current, then you take everything you can and throw it at the smallest amount. And this isn't mathematically correct. Mathematically, you should sort of buy highest interest and go for that one. But we don't have math problems usually, we have like behavior problems. And so yes. um, if you can get rid of that smallest debt, that means that debt and its minimum balance is gone, or that minimum payment's gone. So you can take that minimum payment, all the extra and then roll it into your second smallest debt. And it gives you this big emotional win. So if you go from like five debts to four debts, cut that card, throw it away, like one less stress out of your life, then I think you, you referenced this earlier. Once you start to feel that momentum, those emotional wins, that progress, that traction, then things start to accelerate. And you're like, oh man, okay, I got rid of one debt. And then the second debt's gonna go faster because I'm throwing even more at it every month. And then by the time you get to the big one at the long line, you've, you've got rid of the other four or five debts and now you're throwing maybe 2,000 a month or whatever it is at this debt. And you know, you know, I'm just ringing out random numbers. If you're listening and you're just like, I don't have $2,000, that's okay. Like everyone's situation is different. Maybe it's $200 yeah. for you. But, you know, I think that order is how you start to feel that traction, which is going to accelerate things because you're like, oh, man, that went pretty fast. If I pick up one more shift instead of going out one night a week, then instead of losing money, I'm gaining money. And then the whole thing, like, gets even faster. It makes perfect sense because the satisfaction of going down from maybe five bills coming in a month to four is just one less. And there's that. You're, you're, it's, it's satisfying. Yeah. I read an article last even. night about people starting to do transfers on balances now that interest rates are rising. So all these cards are coming about that are offering free six months, which to me, six months flies by if you have 30,000 debt and the rate might be even higher on this new card and you lose. How do you roll with your credit cards? Do you like to stay loyal to one card 
And, and, and these companies, or are you somebody who would suggest someone move around and bounce around with these credit cards? So I feel that when I was starting my company in my early 20s, I, the company didn't make enough money to pay me a salary and I was living on credit cards. I'd literally go to the grocery store with a credit card and I would roll from 0% to 0% and it was a dangerous game. And, you know, looking back on it, I was a like hungry little entrepreneur who needed to grow my company, but it was a dangerous game. Um, and you know how I got rid of that debt? By paying it off, you know, not by moving around. And so the way I do credit cards now is I have exactly two credit cards. I have my oldest credit card where I keep all of my recurring payments on it. So like bills okay. and stuff. And I do that just so that it stays current, gets it gets paid in full every single month. I have it it's on auto pay. So when, when that bill comes in, it automatically pays it. And then I have my favorite credit card, which I like the points or whatever. I'm not a really big guy in points because I know a lot of millionaires, but none of them got there by collecting credit card points. I can promise <laughs> you that. Um, and so I take my fav favorite credit card, I put all my spending on it. And then, I, then if my favorite credit card gets stolen or something because I'm using it all the time, at least I don't have to retype in all my bills, you know, like, Smart. Um, and so like that old credit card is only used for that stuff. And then with those two, it kind of optimizes your credit score because you keep a very long credit history. It, it saves you some asshole. And then, yeah, never carry a balance. I pay it off in full every single month. And so, you know, if you're someone who's paying off debt, I'd say, you know, if you switch to a 0% card, that's fine. But like, don't kid yourself into thinking that you've made something happen because you haven't, you still owe all the money. And so I'd still go back to that snowball, pay aggressively on the smallest debt and then work up from there. I, that's very smart that you're one card because it is chasing all of that and re-entering everything in, and that is solid right there. And then this, and I think we don't have enough education in the United States about financial awareness and financial wellness. And I remember when I got my first job, I was already getting credit cards sent to me. I was, uh, gosh, yeah. I wasn't even 16 yet. The gap sent me $300. And as a kid, I was like, oh my gosh, I just got a free $300. And I thought you just pay the minimum. Like it, it took me, but it was too young to be put in that situation. Okay. We didn't have ATM machines back then. We, we deposited our check in the bank. We kept out what we wanted. You know, you had to walk back into the bank to get more money. So you just didn't do those things, but it's very those different. Things. It's yeah. It's so cr I remember when ATM machines came out, my parents didn't trust them. They would still walk into the bank. That's old school. They were like, I don't know how how's this money spit out of here. I don't know. We're using cash app and all these, you, oh, using, yeah, you have Apple all Pay, all. you know, you have all these different things, but for the suggestion for somebody to really understand what credit cards are used for, they are used for a, as just not to have cash on you, but the goal is to not spend more than you can pay off every month. Yeah. I say, if you can't use your credit card as though it's a debit card, don't have it, you know, cut it up, <clears throat> you know, people, who think it's a tool to like acquire debt. And, you know, if, if you're at risk of carrying credit card balance, because, you know, credit card <laughs> rates are insane. insane. So if you look at your bank account, if you have like a savings account with Bank of America, you might get like, be getting 0.01% interest. So that means if you like, you know, if you have $10,000 in there for 40 years, I think they pay you like a hundred bucks or something. Um, if you get like a high yield savings account right now, it's like 2%. And so you might, you know, if you have 10,000 bucks, you might get 200 bucks per year, which, you know, is nice. If you have a credit card, you're not paying 0.1% or 2%. You're paying like 20%. You know. And that's insane because insane. Cause then because then next year, not only do you pay 20% of what your balance, you have to pay 20% of the interest too. And so it, <clears throat> it creates this compound interest exponentially exploding in, uh, in of debt. And so if you might be carrying a balance like you're not ready for credit cards and so you should be dealing in cash or debit cards because it's devastating to your financial life it's just crippling you're basically paying loan shark fees to buy a shirt or something it's just devastating you know obviously i'm like a little bit of a hypocrite because i did with my um with my business but like you know i'd say even today i was like maybe i should have been going to like food banks maybe i should should have been working more part-time jobs i was working some part-time jobs, jobs but you know carrying a balance is a, is like a, the worst thing you can do in your financial life. But you did it for a period of time, uh, to get you through a situation. It wasn't your entire life. And I think when people do something, it become a habit and it could just be, Oh, I get these bills. I pay the minimum, which is really only interest people. You're only paying the interest. You're not right. paying. The minimum is just you borrowing more money. And I was fortunate to have a friend that took years to get out of credit card debt. And she was diligent about getting out of that credit card debt and moving forward. She never carried credit cards. She only had them for 
car breaks down, appliance, what have you. But when we would shop or go anywhere, she would use cash and it helped her stay on a budget. She's like, you count out cash. It is such a different vibe than yeah. using a credit card on, especially clothes. You know, you're, you're yeah. not going to buy a $400 coat counting out cash. You're going to really think, do I need this coat? Will it go on okay. sale? You know, is it a necessity? All of those things. And I think our lack of education and the fact that people do believe we're in a borrower society and that carrying debt is no big deal, but debt is heavy and it weighs on you more than you realize because you can't switch jobs. You can't easily pivot and say, hey, I would love to be able to take off and take care of an ill family member for a period of time. You don't have freedom. You don't have flexibility. Yeah. Also, they've done studies on cash versus credit cards and a credit card, you know, people love credit card points. It's like a game, like they, they, their minds are filled with like upgraded flights to Asia or whatever. But, you know, on average, you know, a credit card point is worth like two cents. So if you spend a dollar, you get two cents back. But they've done studies that show people when spending on a credit card versus cash spend about twice as much with the credit card, which is bananas, right? And you're right, because it's so abstract. It just flows. It's like, a $60 shirt or a $90 shirt or a $400 coat, it just swipes, you don't think about it. But when you're like, you're like, how many 20s is 400? And you're like, what on earth? You know, suddenly it's less abstract. It's like physical there. Your wallet went from like an inch thick to, to nothing. And so if you're chasing, you know, if you're spending $2 to get two cents, you're in a terrible position. And so like, I, I think what your friend's doing, fantastic. You know, it's not obviously not for everyone. You know, like I use a credit card, but I only use it like a debit card pay off. And she's scarred. She, she, yeah. she's scarred herself and doesn't trust herself and just, and it cost her years of her life yeah. of working second jobs to just not have, you know, free time and to just be working those second jobs just to pay down that debt. It was about $30,000 in debt, but that can take a working person a long time to pay off and yeah. making extra money at a side job is, you know, five, $600 a week, but she chipped away at it. I wonder what the psychology is now with Apple pay, because now you could be on Instagram. Instagram and you could see something you want and just tap twice on your phone. You don't even have to open your wallet and bring out the credit card anymore. It is just right there. I agree. And even worse, they have, uh, what is it called? Like, like rent own or payments now where you, there's like something that's like a hundred dollars yeah. and they're like, or six payments of 1667 or whatever. And, and I've heard stories about people who like, oh, okay, yeah, 16 bucks, that sounds good, because they're thinking in this payment mindset, like, what can I afford payments? But then they buy one, and then they buy two, then they buy three, suddenly they've their payments are hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month, because they bought thousands and thousands of dollars worth of goods. And now, you know, they're just, they're drowning, they're underwater. And so you have to get out of that payment mentality. And, and yeah, I don't know, I mean, I, I love what you're friended, but think about what can work for you to not just have this abstract swipe, 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 and wonder where all your money went. Yeah. My rule of thumb is if I can't pay it off at the end of the month, I'm not doing it. It's just that simple that my credit card is just so I don't have to carry cash and run to the ATM machine all the time. It's just a monthly borrowing system where I refuse to pay interest. So we, we covered savings, credit cards, and expenses. The last thing I want to run through with you is let's say somebody comes into a $20,000 inheritance. They have $5,000 in debt. And let's say they're 25 years old. Where do they start with saving? I know the first thing you're going to say is pay off that $5,000 debt. You're right. So I'd probably pay off the debt. I'd probably take 10000 and put it into a cash emergency fund, leave it there, not to be touched except for emergency. Then with that last $5,000, i would probably start what's called a Roth IRA, which is a type of account, like a bank. It's a bank account, like a checking account or a savings account. But it's a special account where if you put money in, you never pay tax on that money ever again. And so what you can do inside that account is you can invest. And so if you put $5,000, let's say you're 25, you retire at 65, that's 40 years. And money doubles about once every seven years. And so that's about five opportunities for it to double. And so $5,000 doubled five times becomes 10,000, 20,000, 40,000, 80,000, $160,000. And it would be 100% tax-free because it's in that Roth IRA. And so 160, turning 5,000 to $160,000 is how rich people get rich. You know, you hear about NFL stars, you hear about you know, lottery winners, but most millionaires are just living below their means. They're investing along the way. And, you know, you, we wonder why there's a bunch of rich old people. It's because they've been doing it for 40 years. Not every old person's rich. There's a lot of broke old people too, but the power of time is so powerful. And so this 25 year old say, Hey, take advantage of this tax break inside a Roth IRA, put your money in, 
you buy what's called an index fund, which is basically buying all the stocks in the stock market at very low costs, like a direct way for all the profits and growth of the companies of the world to come right back to you. And then you don't pay tax on that forever. And so that 5,000 will turn to 160. If you do that for 10 years, 5,000 a year, about 450 bucks a month, that's not 160,000. Now you're talking 1.6 million. And that's just from 10 years of investing. Uh, that's what I would do. And it's really about having the tenacity to say, that money is doing something for me right now. Do not be tempted to spend it. Do not be tempted to upgrade your life as you watch it grow over those each period that it doubles. You have to be smart enough to plan for later and to know that you're not going to touch this now. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a mindset shift because instead of getting, you know, a new trip or a new, I mean, and I love trips I, and, and by the way, like, you know, spending money on things you love is good. Just don't spend all your money, carve some <laughs> out, put it in a Roth IRA, grow that wealth. And, you know, think about buying an index fund. You're buying something, you get, maybe get a little endorphin to, to kick. And I do think once you start to see it grow, it accelerates, you know, it starts with, Ooh, I, instead of 5,000, you know, what if I did 8,000 or what, you know, yeah. and then, and then you can say, okay, instead of worrying about being rich when I'm 70, you can think about retiring early. In fact, if you invest half of your take home pay, which is obviously an extreme measure, um, but if you're making 80 and you want to live on 40 and be a little bit extreme, like fine minimalism, fine simplicity, starting from zero, starting from broke, you can retire 15 years later. And so if you're 25 and you're broke and you, came into a good job and you wanted to live on half your money in 15 years at the age of let's call it 39.9, uh, you never have to work again because your investments will have grown so large that they kick off enough growth and dividends that you can just live off that for the remainder of your life. It's all just fascinating and it seems like common sense, but since it's not something that we're taught in school and then we are faced with so much. I think even more with social media, the temptation, the clothes, the handbags, all of the things that are just there, like it's going to make you somebody because all of these people are somebody. It's harder than ever, I think, but it's time is now to do it because the younger you start, the easier it is. And there's just a feeling of security knowing that later on you can travel as much as you want because you've saved your money. You can do things. And I'm like you, I like to travel to me. Experiences are what I want to do, but I'm not like ridiculously ordering takeout and paying these fees all the time. There's little ways where I'm frugal. I cook most of my meals. If I'm going to eat out, it's going to be an experience with friends. And I believe in making it something, not just to be going out to buy something to eat for necessity, because I do love to cook and it's easy to meal prep. But those little things, what I spend on groceries, most of my closest friends spend in two days eating out and my groceries last me a week. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we... One of the things I think people confuse with is between frugality and cheapness. And cheapness is where you like all that matters is price. You know, you don't tip. You don't. You know, you, you're just always stingy with money. You're not charitable. Frugality is all about maximizing the value of your dollar. And so, like one of my favorite sayings is like fewer things but nicer things. I'd much rather have like one shirt that's expensive, maybe that looks good, that fits well, than have ten crappy shirts that I'm unhappy yep. with. And, you know, an extreme example of this is if you see those hoarder shows and you like look at oh. the side of their house and you're like, oh my God. The anxiety like, I feel. The money that they've spent. And <laughs> the, like, you know, like those hoarders are, were, would have been millionaires if they would have been investing that money, right? Um, and I, honestly, I think there's a little bit of that in all of us. Like I, I, I'm on a social media platform. I like, I'm now like taking my life very public because I spend money, but like, I could go through my list of Amazon purchases over the last year and just find some stuff that like, you know, probably is sitting on a shelf that I don't need because in the moment I wanted it. And, and so, you know, there's not, you know, there's not perfect or terrible, you know, it's all these shades of gray and we just need to figure out how can we like be frugal, get more value from our money, save some and invest so we can be free and free of stress and retire, retire early and not, you know, go towards the hoarder end of the spectrum. Yeah, cheap is something we don't want to be, but frugal is something like I will wait till Nordstrom has a sale for the couple things that I know will be there when I want them just because if they're not a necessity, then and, and all of these stores now have sales because they have so much inventory, they end up having to get rid of it. I will look around at TJ Maxx and Marshalls because every once in a while you find something awesome there. Yeah. But again, it's not a necessity when you're not buying to satisfy yourself. You're just looking around. But this is a great conversation for everyone. And Jeremy, I appreciate you coming on and sharing this knowledge. And I think 
what people are going to pull from this conversation is a great reminder. Like there's always something you could do a little bit better to tweak something, to have more savings, to be more comfortable, to be less stressed about a job maybe you don't like because you've been planning and you have the opportunity to take some time off and look for something better. You feel like your future is going to be brighter and there's nothing better than knowing that you're not going to be struggling older when your health insurance is more and everything else is more expensive as you get older. I agree. I love it. I love that you're doing this. I mean, we we don't teach it in school. And so it's it's a crazy thing that we kind of like are left to a couple of us influencers, whatever we are, to just try to help bring the word out. But, you know, I'm one actual millionaire. This is how I did it. Hopefully, yeah, you can take some, some tips from that. I appreciate your time. Everybody check out personalfinanceclub.com. And Jeremy, we'll talk again. Thanks, Lisa. Now that was a great conversation. Jeremy Schneider, thank you so much for your time. This was a redo interview and so worth redoing because we could all be more financially aware. We could all look at debt and realize how important it is to not have it. We can all live a more free life by saving, by not living beyond our means, by just being frugal, not cheap, but frugal. So check out everything at Personal Finance Club. It is the moment you've all been waiting for. That's right. It is the mailbag portion of the exercise. If you want to be part of the mailbag, you can email me at asklisaann at gmail.com. And we know that this is sometimes a bit of a wild ride. I'm going to say that... uh, there's a lot of goodness in this one here. There's been some decent emails. I'm actually pretty shook, but it wouldn't be the same as so many of my friends will go through and say, you know, I just really liked the first couple of emails because it's wild, because it's a rally, because it's out there. It, it shouldn't be out there, but it is. So as I always do, when I put together the emails that I'm choosing to read to you in the ask Lisa Ann at Gmail mailbag, I put the wild ones first so that I could read them. We could laugh. And then we could just move on to greener pastures. So here's a good one. Subject matter. What's app number? Dear Lisa Ann, me, I have you WhatsApp number. If I come to you, can I have sex with you? Question mark, question mark, question mark. This is from Zarzang. So you all know I did have to block Zarzang because Zarzang been mad phone calling on the Google chat feature, which I thought I had turned off. And I went to go check my email to put this mailbag together. And there were about 200 missed calls. So I think he thinks my Google chat number, which is just calling if I was on Google. Don't worry. I've changed all the settings since then. Uh, we all know that whether he has a number or not, he's not having sex with me. It's also very strange that someone thinks this is absolutely possible. And um, obviously not very well aware of a reality there. And here's another. Hi, this is from Tiger and not Tiger Woods. So, you know, my name is Nick. I follow you on Twitter and TikTok. Are you still in the industry? Question mark. Are you making any new movies? Because I haven't seen any new movies of yours lately. And I look forward to hearing back from you soon. Thank you. And have an amazing week. Do like how he ended that email. Thank you. And have an amazing week. I do have to refresh that I retired years ago many times, which I understand because my previous career was not time sensitive. I'm sure there's someone new seeing it every day and not knowing that that was years ago. But yes, I did retire. No, I will not be coming back. I am living an incredible life, way better than I ever imagined that it would be. I was very diligent about working hard and saving money in the industry and providing myself the life that I have now. But it wasn't really till I turned 50 this year that it hit me that it worked which is mind blowing. I had just been working and saving and working and saving and doing my things and then becoming a minimalist, even more saving. Um, but it worked. I traveled. I saw the world. I filled an entire passport. I still get the luxury of travel. I'm going to Switzerland for a trade show at the end of the month in October, but I will stay retired. It was a fun ride, but like anything else, evolving to something new for somebody that's a celebrity in in any sort of form, athlete, you know, musician, people do transition into their next walk of life, which is where I am right now. So thank you. This is an interesting one. Do you know me? With no question mark is in the subject matter. I think I'm talking to you when I think I'm talking to a scammer is too many scams on the internet. Have a nice day. 
and sweetheart, I love you, Archie. So I think this person's talking to somebody else and thinks they're talking to me and it's probably a scammer. So here's what I've done to make that really clear. And this might help people if you listen to my podcast. (laughs) The only time I interact is on live streams. Every Wednesday, I do a Facebook live that I call Just Chat. And that's kind of my chance to uh, talk about the new release of my podcast, uh, maybe the guests, you know, these types of things. I randomly, at different times of the week, do IG lives on my Instagram account. All of my social media is the same, the really Sam. I do not respond to any fans by direct message. I do not engage with any fans from any different platforms other than my verified accounts on the public messages. So if you leave a comment to me on Instagram in the public forum, I might comment back, right? But if you say I DM'd you, I'll write back to you, I don't DM. The reason I set these standards is to avoid people being scammed. So if I'm telling you right now, I do not direct message, I do not private message, I do not private Facebook message, I do not private Instagram message, I do not direct message on Twitter, I do not do any of that. If you are talking to somebody on any of those forums and you know they are a scammer, the reason I stopped talking to people in private message was really to remove this risk. If you can't say it to me on my public profile under the comment section, that it doesn't need to be said. So I'm doing this to protect you and to protect me. So if you are having a conversation with somebody that says, oh, this is Lisa Ann's private account, my other accounts are too, that's a scam. Don't fall for it. Do not fall for these imposter accounts that are scamming you because there's nothing I can do about it. You know what I did? I worked incredibly hard to have all of my social media profiles match. The Real Lisa Ann on Twitter, the Real Lisa Ann on Instagram, the Real Lisa Ann on Facebook, all verified. The Real Lisa Ann on YouTube. It took me two years to get the Real Lisa Ann on TikTok, but I I was committed and I stuck with that shit and I got it. And I did that to avoid. But for some reason, people are still falling for imposters. And that's kind of on you because I talk about this all the time. But again, maybe you don't listen to my podcast. But so, Live streams are where you're going to see me talking to you, whether it's live stream on my YouTube, whether it's a live stream on my Facebook, whether it's a live stream. I wish there was still Periscope on Twitter. I did kind of like that. I'm not going to lie. I don't really do the spaces thing. I haven't done it yet. But on my Instagram accounts, maybe on Dudes Do Better, sometimes I do on IG Live, but there is no messaging. So for this person that says, do you know me? I think I'm talking to you and I think I'm talking to a scammer. You're talking to a scammer. All right. We got a couple more. And this is where they get good. The Lisa Ann Experience Mailbag. Craig says, good morning. I'm sure you've never heard this before, but I am your biggest fan. Just curious, have you ever been approached to appear in a mainstream feature film? Have a great day, Craig. So I have not yet been approached to be in a mainstream feature film, but I have had some pretty cool things. I was featured in an Eminem video for the song, We Made You. That's pretty cool. I played myself on Billions, uh, season four, episode seven. And I know there's some other things that I'm truly forgetting right now that I wanted to write down before I got to this, but then I didn't. But I am open-minded. I am a member of SAG. Oh, wait, I know there's two things right here. Boom. Thank you. A little bit of SAG. Um, I did stunts, so I wasn't featured. You didn't know it's me, but I did stunts and body double work in The Black Swan. And I did stunts in Noah, both Darren Aronofsky films. So I have done those things. I am in SAG. I am willing to do, but I don't go to castings and I don't do any of that stuff. But when somebody reaches out, I'm always like, yeah, I'll do this. Uh, Doing stunts was really cool. Being on Billions as such a fan was awesome. But great question, Craig. Appreciate you. Let's go to the next one. BA asks, Hi, Lisa. Have you ever visited Ireland? Regard, Benz. I would love to visit Ireland. It is on my wish list. And strangely, no, I've not yet visited. I'd love to go back around St. Patrick's Day, tour the Jameson plant, go to that big festival that's there. So it is on my list. I do want to go and I will make it happen. Last question here for the mailbag. Jared says, hey, I'm a big fan of yours. How are you doing? This is my question. 
How is life treating you after your retirement? Great question, Jared, because life is treating me very well. There's things that I love so much about my new life that I fantasized about in my old life. And this might sound crazy to all of you, but earlier I mentioned my schedule for four years was being on the road Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday flying to New York, Monday night doing a show at the studios in New York till midnight, Tuesday morning being back at the airport at 5 a.m., going directly to set, working Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, flying back out. So there was this constant packing and unpacking bags. There was this constant traveling. There was this constant, I fantasized about simple things like making my own food. You get so sick of eating out, especially when you're traveling to maybe smaller towns where there's not a lot of great choices. It's only franchise restaurants. Your hours are wild. And I was smart. I would always go to the grocery store. It saved me a ton of money on the road. I would always get a little fridge in my room. Very easy to get. Most hotels have them in case babies with formula, people are diabetic. Like there's, there's little fridges. You can always ask for a little fridge at a hotel. Sometimes they charge you. Sometimes they don't but it was cheaper than room service. I didn't waste as much food. So I'd get picked up at the airport. I'd have the driver take me to the grocery store and I'd just buy like bananas, yogurt, maybe some stuff for wraps, you know, simple stuff that didn't take up a lot of space that I could have for the couple of days I was there. So I fantasized about making my own food and I fantasized about having a routine, knowing that I could go to bed within the same window of time, which right now, other than nights when there's football games on, it's between nine and 10. And that might mean like I'm going to lay in bed and read for half an hour. I'm going to watch a TV show. Um, But routine, because when you go to bed around the same time, you automatically would get up around the same time, which means I could go to the gym at the same time, which means I can then get into the sauna and meditate and like routine. Like I just fantasized about routine. And then I also wanted to be able to spend more time with my friends. And of course, most of my friends worked Monday through Friday. So with me being gone every weekend, I was always missing out on this, like getting to see my friends. And so I have more quality time with the people that matter in my life. I have more freedom than I've ever had. I live in this beautiful routine space that I really wanted. And I can look back on all the fun that I had and all the places I traveled and all the people that I met with such an incredible amount of gratitude. So retirement life uh, has been treating me very, very well. And also a lot of that is because of all of you still going along with my journey, still following my path in life, still listening to my podcast, being a part of me on social media, being a part of the radio shows that I've done. Like the fact that everyone, so many incredible people have come along with me on this next stage of my journey has been really empowering and I'm just super thankful. So another episode in the books, don't forget to go to personalfinanceclub.com. Follow all things Jeremy Schneider. He is fantastic. Learn more about your financial wellness. Put aside some money, save for a rainy day, be prepared. And remember stuff is just stuff. It's not going to make you any happier. What's going to make you happier is knowing that you are financially free. You can take care of yourself. And if you want to take a day off, you can. There's something to be said for that. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. 